is the Fed's slow response making everything worse? Right, so where, where were we? We are, uh, boom, boom, boom. There we are. This is like in our history class, right? Remember the paintings. This is Michelangelo here. Uh, the Fed did nothing for a whole year. Is that making inflation much worse? Or in some sense, is this a transitory inflation that will kind of go away on its own if the Fed does nothing? Maybe the Fed could help on the margins, but it's not spiraling out of control by the Fed doing nothing. That's a big, tough question. Well, let me give you the traditional theory on this. Uh, the traditional theory is absolutely. And you can see economists from Larry Summers on the left to John Taylor on, I think of him as the center, but maybe Larry thinks somewhere else, uh, <laughs> are, are, are criticizing the Fed for its slow movement because, because by being slow, it's making everything worse. So what's the theory? I, I come from the University of Chicago where the saying was, well, so much for the real world. Now, how does it work in theory? But that's important. <laughs> Because if you don't understand how it works in theory, you don't understand anything. The real world is full of all sorts of correlations that are meaningless. And only by understanding a mechanism can you help to sort out cause and effect in life. So what's the cause and effect? The traditional view is that if the Fed does nothing, inflation is unstable. What does that mean? Now, we know um, interest rates and inflation actually have to move together positively. If you're in... in um, uh, Argentina, say, with 200% inflation, interest rates are going to be around 200%. They have to be. Because if inflation's 200% and you're only getting 10% on your, on your money, you're losing 190% in real terms all the time. So they move together in the long run. The question is, is this a stable or unstable relationship? Is, uh, so what does unstable mean? I'm giving you three versions of unstable. Uh, <laughs> the graph, if the Fed does nothing, any initial shock to inflation gets worse and worse and worse. That's what unstable means. Uh, or in any initial shock to deflation spirals away. So that's what I mean. That's the doctrine that if the Fed leaves interest rates alone, inflation will spiral away. You need the Fed to move. The seal is another version of the doctrine. <laughs> the seal is the Fed that controls interest rates. Inflation is the ball. You, you, that's a sense of what unstable means. Now, in the long run, the ball and the seal all move together, right? But the seal can't just sit there or the ball rolls off. Or number three, my prop. In, this is interest rates. This is inflation. This is an unstable system. If I do nothing, if I'm the Fed and I just snooze, and there's a shock to inflation, let's say you know, fiscal policy or supply chains or oil shocks or whatever, anything that moves inflation a little bit, what happens? Boom, spirals out of control. What's the solution to unstable inflation in this view of the world? Well, the seal is smart. The seal can keep that ball up there. How? If inflation moves 1% this way, the seal has to move interest rates more than 1% to get back under the inflation and stabilize it. That's the Taylor rule. Move interest rates more than one for one with inflation, and you take something that's inherently unstable and you make it stable again. So here's, here's, my, uh, here's my effort. Vote for me for Fed chair. Can I do it? Let's see. All I got to do is move this one for one for that uh, in a hurricane. So, Am I ready? But you can see, uh, as I was doing it, I move more than one for one, and I stabilize inflation. And if I don't, boom, there we are. Now, where is that, in, 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 where does that come, let's a little more, yes, please. Am I ready? I don't think that'll work with Biden, but maybe if Trump comes back, I can get the job. Um, <laughs> economics, the, the one piece of economics I want you to, what's the causal mechanism here? Why is it unstable? Well, uh, inflation, where does inflation come from? Everybody's theory of inflation is the same. Uh, really, it says inflation comes from expected inflation and then is pushed down by high real interest rates. The real interest rate is the nominal interest rate, the one that you see in the paper, minus what people think inflation will be. How much do you get back in real terms? This causes confusion too. I remember a story I told to me in grad school. Uh, 
professor of mine was, was consulting with the uh, head of GM and said, oh, did you use real or nominal interest rates in that, in that uh, calculation? And the head of GM said, this was way back, head of GM said, of course I use real interest rates, the real ones, you read the newspaper every day. No, okay, you didn't laugh. Those are the nominal ones, the, uh, the ones in terms of dollar, not in terms of real dollars after taking care of inflation. So everybody agrees on this, why? If you knew inflation would be high next year, what do you do? You're a consumer. I'm sorry? Hoard, and in order to hoard, you go buy. Thank you, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> if you know prices are going up, you go buy today. What happens? Sends prices up today. If you're, if you're uh, running a store and you know inflation's gonna be high next year, what do you do? Raise prices now. So inflation has that property, sort of like the stock market, that it does today what people are expecting it to do tomorrow. That's an important force of inflation, which makes it so hard to predict. Secondly, if, if real interest rates are high, that depresses the economy, that induces, it's intentional. The Fed raising real interest rates, the point is to induce a little bit of a recession that pushes down inflation today. So that's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two is the idea, so what's in, what do people expect for inflation? Well, let's suppose common sense, they expect inflation next year to be something like what it was this year. That's called adaptive expectations, a reasonable place to start. Those two ingredients, now you, you can see, Look, inflation is expected inflation. If inflation is last year's inflation, then a, a low real interest rate will send this year's inflation up over last year's inflation. So that's, in words, how it is that, that that's a economic theory that delivers this idea of unstable inflation, that the Fed not moving causes any initial shock to spiral away. And it says this inflation, where are we now? We are now, <laughs> interest rates at about 2%, inflation at about 9%. How are we going to get inflation under control? If this is the right theory, there's only one way, <laughs> right? We gotta get under that 9%. We need 10, 11, 12% interest rates right now. Will that cause a recession? Absolutely, and that is the point. The point is to move that high real interest rate thing to really nail inflation today. Whew. That's, uh, imagine the kind of recession we'd have with 9, 10, 12% interest rates. Now, so much for theory, what about the facts? This theory, like all good theories, has a background in facts, and that is the experience of the 1970s. And the stylized version of history that is told about the 1970s. So what happened, according to this stylized uh, uh, theory? Uh, there were shocks in the, in the late 1960s, there was a fiscal shock. Uh, Johnson wanted to run the war in Vietnam. He wanted to run the Great Society, uh, and he didn't want to pay for it with taxes. So inflation starts up. Um, the Fed, and then in the 1970s, there's oil price shocks. There were bad shocks. But it's not the shocks per se. It was the Fed's inaction. According to this theory, the Fed moved too slowly. There was a shock. There was a wind. There was something that pushed inflation up. The Fed didn't move quickly enough and therefore you got inflation. It's not the shock, it's the accommodation. The oil price can go up relative to everything else. Now, what the Fed, the Fed gets to choose is what's the overall level here. So by not moving, the oil price goes up relative to everything else, and by not moving, what the Fed does is lets everything keep going up together, rather than suffer the pain of oil price goes up, okay, we'll bring out the inflation. Uh, then finally, as you can see in 1980, uh, the Fed started raising, look at that, raising interest rates. The real interest rate is the difference between these lines. So here the Fed is, the real interest rate is basically zero through the 1970s. The Fed is moving interest rates up, but never enough to get under the ball. It's always, it, it's, uh, the interest rates, you know, real interest rates about zero, 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 boom. A decade of enormous real interest rates to really push that inflation back down again. So that's the standard story. And um, that, in addition to the real interest rates pushing inflation down, the Fed revealed it was serious. And they, they lasted through two bruising recessions, two politically horrible recessions for the Reagan administration. But they kept at it. And that seriousness, so we got two parts. The high real interest rates moved inflation down, and the seriousness pushed the expected inflation down, and inflation was wrong. So that's the standard story. 
uh, which we can talk about if it's right now, but at least it's a good story. So always a theory should have uh, logic and a good story, and this has logic and good story. Now, as far as where we are now, notice the 1970s, even the awful 1970s, which, which I lived through, and, and the photographs are really embarrassing with the long hair and the bell-bottom jeans and the rest of it. Um, even in the 1970s, the Fed moved interest rates one for one with inflation. Didn't move more than one for one. It never waited a whole year to do nothing. Look at this, here we are now. Compare the 1970s to right now. You wanna run out and pull the alarm bell? <laughs> the Fed never waited a whole year to do nothing. So if you take that stylized history, boy are we, we, are, boy are we in trouble. Uh, John was being very polite about, uh, about where it goes. Well, maybe not. <laughs> So there's always another theory, and let me tell you the new, what I consider new, in quotes, because this is a theory that started in about 1975, so it's hard to call it new, but, and it's, it's common in academia. But it's fun, there's a fundamentally different possibility. Uh, and uh, so in terms of ingredients, I'm still gonna think, so this, if you come away with anything, remember, inflation equals expected inflation minus the effect of high real interest rates. That's the, that, that's the uniform way we think of, that's, that's the quote Phillips curve today. The whole question is though, where do the expectations come in? So a new view is, wait, maybe people aren't that dumb. Maybe they think about inflation next year, not just mechanically what happened last year. Maybe they, they, they think harder about next year. Now, this is called rational expectations, which makes everybody, especially in Cambridge, Massachusetts, go nuts. Oh, how could the little peasants be rational? We're so much smarter than they are. But we're not asking for clairvoyance. All we're thinking is that people are no worse than, econ no better than economists. <laughs> so they can see the future about as well as we can see the future, not that they're irretrievably dumb and we're so much smarter than them that we can have models that, that they don't have access to. Um, so if you take that as your basic theory, now, now what happens? Well, now look, instead of past inflation on the right-hand side, Inflation is gonna be driven by future, expected future inflation. We've changed the sign there. And what that means is that inflation is stable, even if the Fed does nothing. The inflation will eventually settle down after a shock. It is, so what does stable mean? Well, I brought two dynamics. This is called dynamic systems. So here's a, here's a stable dynamic system, as opposed to a, uh, an unstable dynamic system. So here's the Fed holding interest rates. Here's inflation. This is a stable system. If I do nothing, inflation will eventually settle down on its own. Now, of course, in reality, there's, we're in a windstorm, so there's all sorts of stuff going on. It's hard to tell. Is, it, is, it, is this, look at the data. Is this what's happening? <laughs> or is this what's happening? All you get to see is the data. Awfully hard to tell apart, isn't it, in normal times? Uh, of course, uh, there's, there's an experiment that can tell us, is it normal times or not normal times? Let's, is there a time when interest rates actually were stuck at zero to let us know? The answer is yes, 2008. In 2008, uh, interest rates hit zero, deflation broke out, and the whole conventional view said there's going to be a deflation spiral. Why? Exactly the opposite of what we're looking at now. Deflation's breaking out, the Fed can't lower interest rates below zero. You've seen the unstable graph. So we have a clear prediction made by half the op-ed writers in, in the country, deflation spiral, here it comes. What actually happened? Drum roll, please. So here's the incipient deflation spiral. You can see inflation. Inflation gets out ahead of the interest rate. The Fed can't move it. Not, not just it didn't, it can't. They can't lower interest rates below zero. So what happens, Every, everyone say, oh God, here comes the deflation spiral. You know, real interest rates are high, right? The interest rate is higher than the inflation rate. High real interest rates, we're in a recession already. High real interest rates are gonna make the recession worse. The worst recession is gonna drive inflation down, a never ending spiral until it's 1933 all over again. Uh, desperation, what do we do? Fiscal stimulus was the answer. Uh, but it never happened. Here comes the, here's the deflation spiral, the Fed did absolutely nothing, and boom. And there is sort of, for the first time in, in post-war history at least, an, an experiment 
to how can we tell apart this from this, we tell the seal, stop it, <laughs> stay still. Could you please, in a, as an experiment, stay still and let us know, does the ball fall off your, our head or is it Professor Calculus's little pendulum? Well, there's an interesting experiment. So at least, we, we have at least two conflicting histories, one that suggests stable, one that suggests unstable. This is the most, it's kind of interesting, here we are arguing about the most fundamental question, really, uh, in all of economics. Is the interest rate stable or unstable? Uh, is inflation stable or unstable if the Fed does nothing to interest rates? And we're, still, we're arguing about it. It's kind of interesting. We don't really know the answer to that question. Now, it's not just one episode in the US. Uh, here is on top uh, Europe. So the, in the US, this lasted until uh, Janet Yellen started raising interest rates in 2016. Uh, what happened was inflation, as you can see, uh, unemployment had, had come down again, so they felt like they could start raising rates. Inflation started uh, breaking out, so they did what they normally do when inflation starts breaking out. They started slowly raising interest rates, and that was the end of the experiment in the US. The experiment continues in Europe, so the numbers are kind of small. 2008, Europe interest rates hit zero, and Europe, Europe's interest rates have stayed at zero ever since. Uh, now they got, uh, the, the proposition by the way is it's, it's stable as long as there's no shocks. You hit it with five trillion bucks, you're, you're gonna get some inflation, uh, which would then eventually go away again. Um, but it, it, it was, there's Europe. In fact, Europe, whoops, I'm telling a joke and I'm moving slides at the same time. Um, Europe has actually had about negative 1% interest rates uh, for the last, since 2016. And where's the instability? Where's the, where's the spiral? It's just sitting there doing nothing. Uh, Japan is an even more interesting example. Japan's interest rates hit zero in the late 1990s. For 27 years, interest rate, the seal has been, somebody shot the seal in, in 1994. And, and look at that, you know, inflation bats up and down. There's little shocks, and noise and inflation bats up and down, but there's no spiral whatsoever. So there is uh, now, actually, you know, maybe this view that it's stable after all, that if the Fed doesn't, does nothing, inflation w will eventually come back. Maybe, maybe, that's, maybe it is transitory. So I want to show you now, uh, I, I work on models. Uh, I'm not going to show you a whole slide full of equations, which is my specialty for putting to sleep my uh, economics uh, colleagues. Uh, but this is a very simple, it, it, they're act I'm just saying models so you know I didn't draw these uh, freehand. <laughs> There's actually some, some rigor behind this. But here's an example. Here's a, how the, quote, new, uh, you know, 1970s, 1980s view of the world uh, works. There's two things, that, and I think these are two conceptual experiments worth keeping in the back of your mind. What happens to the economy if uh, we drop uh, five trillion bucks of uh, <laughs> government debt on the economy that the government doesn't plan to pay back? And people take this stuff and say, well, that's nice, but this is a terrible investment. Let's spend it now before, before it depreciates away. And what happens, and the Fed does absolutely nothing, right? So that's a model, John, John advertised model. I take this economic model and I ask the economic model, hey, what would happen if we dropped some government debt on here, uh, if, uh, a fiscal shock, and the Fed does nothing about it? And the model says, okay, sir. I'll calculate the answers to that question. This is a model of the newer form. It's a model where, as you can see, inflation is eventually stable. There's a big inflation, and then the inflation slowly goes away, and we're about here in this process. It's a one, it is transitory. It's a one-time inflation because I asked the model, models are always garbage in, garbage out. Here's the garbage that went in. There is a one-time fiscal shock, and we'll never do it again, sir. So this projection is not a forecast of what ha is gonna happen in the future, because I think we're gonna have like 27 more fiscal shocks and things are gonna get worse. But this is if there is nothing bad happening in the future, on this day, we drop a bunch of money on them and they don't think that's gonna get paid back by future taxes, what happens? What happens is a, a long period of inflation. And what's going on here is, look, money doesn't grow on trees. Well, it's gotta come from somewhere. Uh, if the government is gonna give you five trillion bucks, somebody has to lose. Does it come from taxpayers? No, 
Does it come from future taxpayers? Because we're borrowing it with a plan to pay back. No. Where is it going to come from? It comes out of the pockets of today's bondholders. If the government drops money it inf and the money inflates, all the people who already had money or government bonds lose. So what has to this has to happen. This is inflation that devalues government debt. There's nothing the Fed can do about it because that has to happen somewhere. So that's shock number one, and that's what I think hit us. And in this, in this view of the world, it's not going to spiral away. It's going to sit here for a while until something bad happens. The Fed does, does something about it. That seems depressing. Uh, who would want to be chair of the Fed if there's nothing you could do about it and everybody thinks it's your fault? Uh, that sounds like the worst job in the world. Well, it might be the worst job in the world, but uh, for other reasons. Um, <clears throat> there is something monetary policy can do. So here is a simulation of what happens if the Fed raises interest rates. See, the interest rate goes up. And in this simulation, I had nothing happens to fiscal policy. There's no more deficits, no less deficits, because that's what the Fed can do. The Fed, on its own, may not drop money from helicopters. It's kind of weird, isn't it? You think of the Fed as in charge of inflation, but it is legally not allowed to do the one thing that would actually create inflation, which is drop money from helicopters. It's also not allowed to do the one thing that would quickly cure inflation, which is go out and take money out of your pocket. Hoover, a uh, uh, helicopter uh, vacuuming. I, we should call it a hoovering, because we're at Hoover. You can't vacuum up money. Why? The Treasury Department is the one in a, in a democracy that is allowed to send money to registered voters or to tax it out of them. An independent bureaucracy like the Fed has no business doing anything of the sort. So that's what's going on here. The interest rate goes up. There's no change in fiscal policy. What does that do? That temporarily lowers inflation, although it raises inflation later on. Because the Fed, that inflation has to happen sooner or later. Just a question of whether sooner or later. But the Fed can make it happen later. In doing so, look, it lo this is output. It creates a little bit of a recession. Yes, the Fed's mechanism is to deliberately create a little recession. Now, hopefully, if the Fed's really good, it does just enough of this on the bottom to offset that on the top and smooth out the inflation. So a, there's plenty of room for the Fed in this sort of new view of the economy. New. It's only 30 years old. Uh, the Fed can still, if there's a shock, a supply shock, a fiscal shock, the Fed can add these things two together and give us a small, smooth inflation. And that's, that's what the Taylor Rule would say to do. The Taylor Rule says, if you see inflation here, add some interest rate there, that is going to offset that, and we get a small, smooth inflation which, with much less output variation. So what's great about the Taylor Rule, and I've got to hand it to John for this, because John keeps saying that, it's not a rule that is good in one particular model. It's not perfect in any particular model, but it's darn good in a whole bunch of models. <laughs> and the, look at what John's Taylor rule just did. It cure, if you think the world is the unstable world, moving interest rates with inflation cures instability. Good rule. Here is exactly the opposite kind of uh, model. I mean, uh, you can't ask for more opposite than this. It's, it's stable rather than unstable. Yet, a Taylor rule is still a good idea. Why? Because it responds to inflation and smooths out the inflation and, and reduces the volatility of, of output. So uh, 10 points for John. Mm -hmm.